and welcome to the Convex Conversation with me, broadcaster Helen Fosperu. This week's guest has been on our screens for the best part of 40 years in, oh, in films. I'm watching his face now. In films, dramas, TV series. I'm thinking of Line of Duty, The Night Manager, Grantchester, Unforgotten, The Trial of Christine Keeler, The Syndicate, The Long Call. And of course, he's a regular in The Good Karma Hospital. That's just a small taster of what is an impressive resume. But if you're as old as I am, he'll be forever Tony in the hugely popular series Men Behaving Badly and the voice of Bob the Builder. I am, of course, talking about actor, beer lover and thoroughly great bloke, uh, Neil Morrissey. Neil, uh, fantastic to see you. Thank you very much. How was that build up? Well, that's pretty good, actually. When you put all those programmes together like that in a sentence, it makes me sound so posh. I know. It sounds good, doesn't it? You are so busy all the time though you're always on our screens and I'm always seeing you pop up on shows like the one show talking about all the different dramas you're in yeah do you feel like you're just having a really great run or yeah you, you've just, always been busy really haven't you yeah I mean I'm touching wood as I say this now it's um, it's been a long time I've been at this game now 40 odd years hardly been out of work he says clutching his <laughs> you wooden you should, chair you should, you should, <laughs> because you know you never underestimate the paranoia <laughs> you know, I'm so glad it's been ongoing but I mean and it's, I, I think I started getting more work, though, when I stopped caring. There was a point when, between Men Behaving Badly and getting, you know, doing more dramas, because I was just offered lots and lots of comedies all the time. There had to be a shift. Even my agent said to me, you know, there may be a bit of time. But then, you know, Waterloo Road happened, and then Jed Mercurio came along and popped me in line of duty. And that's what it's been for what, about 20-odd years. So it's a new generation, really. A lot of people don't know uh, that I ever did comedy. I know. Well, a lot of people won't remember, but perhaps some of the people listening to this won't remember men behaving badly. But yeah. I always dream that a bit like cold feet, that it might come back one day. Do you think it might? Or Well, with everything we do, it's all about script. If Simon writes something marvellous, which of course he'd want paying for, <laughs> <laughs> so that there are the steps, then we'd obviously have a look at it. I mean, I don't know... I don't know whether we could make that programme again now. It's not woke enough, is it? Well, no, maybe not. I mean, men still do behave badly, but (laughs) maybe it's not in the same way as they did in the 90s. Putting ladies' underpants on my head and things like that, (laughs) in the way that I guess, you know, Leslie was kind of objectified a little bit by my character. But... That was the reason, that was the point of it, that we were we were really rubbish and they were really cool and really smart. And so that's what the premise for the whole programme was, that we were a couple of misogynist idiots who couldn't even keep a job, let alone a girlfriend. <laughs> I don't think maybe that would fit now. I mean, you're a silver fox now and sophisticated and in serious dramas. and Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know if it would work. It'd be fun trying. It would be fun trying. And actually, Cold Feet worked, and that was kind of the similar vein, wasn't it? They came yeah. back after a long time away. Yeah, because the way, to, the way to do it would be to have the wokeness involved in it. Like, you know, Tony has become completely woke <laughs> and will not do anything wrong and is so PC, you know, that it's unbelievable. They just have to have lapses after several beers and on the on the sofa in front of the telly. I don't know how it worked because, of course, Martin and Caroline's characters, they had a baby before the end of the series, so this is going to be a 20-odd-year-old boy, or or I think it was a boy that they had. Anyway, someone I can send to the (laughs) off-licence. But it, it'd be fun, it'd be fun, but I can't see it. Do you ever talk about it? I, mean, I know you're still great friends, aren't you, with John Thompson and Martin and, and yeah, some of the sure. cast members. Did you, do you ever flirt with that idea at all? It's always brought up with Martin and I in situations like this, you know, any press, any of that sort of stuff that we do, it always comes up. So we always talk about it, but like we, I think we have pretty much the same answers. If it's written, we'll have a look at it and then should be able to do it. But they'll probably have to pay a lot of money. I think we might be saving up for a bit of a retirement gig. <laughs> <laughs> Is it great being part of a, a long-term series? So now I'm thinking you just referenced Line of Duty. Mm. And I think you came out at the end of series six where I was so hoping you were H. So was I. Were you? <laughs> <laughs> and did you know, did they tell you, do you, are you all sworn to secrecy in the cast? Because that was the nation's kind of biggest secret at that time, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, well, I don't, I wouldn't know what the, the chaps had this time. I don't know where, how far th- things were revealed to them when they were making it this time because it became the sensation didn't it i mean adrian dunbar i was at we were at drama school together were you we've we known each other for 40 odd years you know his mum used to feed me when i was a poor student uh, in in half terms and end of terms and things like that and his family would look after me if i could get myself over to win a skill and and so i know him very very well we see each other quite a lot he's working at the moment so i haven't seen him in ages but 
Yeah, I don't know how much was revealed to them. But anyway, he certainly wouldn't tell me. But I wouldn't ask either. No, Because no. I want to watch it. All, all I knew was that it wasn't me. <laughs> and a load of punters on the street would ask me, is it me? Your age, aren't you? Okay, I could tell you, but I'd have to kill you. <laughs> I loved it, actually. And before we started recording, I was telling you that we're interviewing Vicky McClure yeah. in uh, next month, actually. It sounds like you worked with a great cast on Line of Duty. We bonded so well. You had Vicky McClure and Martin Compton, AD, Craig Parkinson and myself, who were like the main protagonist. There was a few other people knocking about as well. Fantastic cast. And, oh, of course, Lenny, absolute... <sighs> How amazing is that man? He got rounds of applause at the end of scenes. Did he? Yeah, he was that good. You know, Martin had done some indie films and Vicky had done, while she's a BAFTA winner at the time from This Is England, you know, she never needs to get any bother on the street or anything. But as soon as when I was out with everyone, that was when everyone recognised me, you know. So they started calling me TV's Neil Morrissey. They even put me on the call sheet as TV's, just TV's. Not TV's Neil Morris or anything. I was I was TV's. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Sheet. We bonded so well. We had such a brilliant time. You know, we laughed and laughed a lot on that show. We always go out en masse. That was brilliant. It was brilliant fun. You can see the camaraderie. I think Vicky sometimes puts clips still on her socials of being out with Adrian and the yeah. team. And you can just see that there's a real camaraderie between everybody. Did they also, when you're on a programme like that, what's the research like for Line of Duty? Well, they have people, I think all the consultations done before you even go into it. I mean, if I had something to do with um, some big diatribe about police procedure, it's not really going to happen with my character anyway, then you would be, there'd be someone there to have a chat with. So that wasn't really my remit. I mean, I was just there playing a misunderstood individual. <laughs> Did you enjoy being misunderstood? Yeah, it was brilliant. <laughs> was it? I absolutely loved it. Because he was just totally loyal to Lenny's character. And he just wanted out from the beginning. So I was in the first three series. And he just wanted out. He just wanted to retire, get out of the game. There was corruption. There was all this stuff going on. And some of it could come back to bite him. So he just wanted out. And I don't know how bad he was in real life. Just just misunderstood, I'd say. It's nice you still watch it. Oh, I love it. It's one of the best programmes out there anyway, isn't it? I'd watch it if I had never had anything to do with it. It would have been nice to be in there when they got the promotion from BBC Two to BBC One. <laughs> I discovered it a bit late, actually, so I did that binge-watching thing where my children were like, Mum, that's episode, that's five episodes you've watched. I'm like, you know, yeah. go back and do some homework well, or just, go back and play. Yeah, it's one of those really easy ones to just binge, wasn't it? Yeah. Now, what about the Good Karma Hospital? Because this is, we've just got to this end now, haven't yeah. we, of series four. How is that? What's that like to make? Brilliant, again. And this year, of course, um, because it's it's all been a bit weird the last two years, working on anything. So we were out there when Sri Lanka was in lockdown too. We had to spend the first six weeks or whatever not leaving the hotel at all. But we're on a beach with the Indian Ocean right there, constant 27 degrees. Um, The food's really good in, in the hotel. And all the actors were coming into the hotel. So there was plenty of people... There was games and disco night. It was really good. We actually drank them out of beer uh, the first week when after I arrived. And uh, they couldn't get beer because the breweries and everything was closed down. So they were shipping it in from other hotels. Oh, <laughs> not shipping your our, beer in. They should have been shipping yours, shouldn't they? If, if only. I would have loved to have got a couple of barrels of mine over there. That oh, would that would have been fun. amazing. I guess no. the logistics would have been a bit hard work with that. Yeah, because you probably have to ship it. I might have to look into that, though. Get a few shipped over yeah, abs- next time. Absolutely. Tell me a bit about the, she says, flipping from conversation to conversation. Tell me a bit about the beer and how you ended up making your own. There is actually an Instagram site, I'm not sure whether you're aware of it, dedicated to Neil Morrissey with a pint in his hand. I and it's no brilliant. Idea. Every every picture is you with a pint. Well, I, Smiling. It, it, it's it's not called drinking anymore. It's called research. <laughs> Is it? <laughs> yeah. Well, now that you're a beer maker. <laughs> now that I'm a beer maker. Well, I make the, the beer gets made down in um, Norfolk. Wolf Brewery brew that for us under licence. And we sell mainly, actually, to Crystal Palace. But it's also the number one seller in my pub. But there's nothing better than going to your own um, Crystal Palace. isn't the team I've been supporting them for over 40 years. Going down to Crystal Palace and having a pint of your own ale uh, when you're about to watch your, your team go out and play. There's so, that is such a buzz, I cannot tell you, you know. Yeah, better than any award. <laughs> but having your own beer and your own pub, how did you get into all that, Neil, well, we, in the first um, place? I, I had a bit of spare time once. Once, only once. And Channel 4 <laughs> uh, approached us and asked us 
asked me what I wanted to do. And I said, I always wanted to get a, a pub and, and brew beer. And so that's how we, we got into it that way. I had a, a, a business partner at the time who was a, a chef as well and also loved beer from Yorkshire. So we decided to get together and, and invite the cameras in and made a, a brew, made, a, made our first brew um, down in the kitchen with Heath Robinson type equipment. And then um, took that recipe to a brewer, made a brew. It was fantastic. And then we found a pub and got a lease on a pub. And then I got, went and got a deal with Tesco as well. And this was like being shot out of a catapult. And, you know, pretty soon, within a year, we were making like 50,000 bottles a week and uh, knocking them out at Tesco's. Should have had a better businessman on board because they can do all kinds of things to you, like this is a three for two week and you don't get any money. So you you don't make profit. And then sometimes they can back it as well. Like, you know, There's 20,000 bottles we're not going to use this week. And then we get left with the stock. We just did it badly. Anyway, we got rid of all of that and just settled on a pub. And then Foxy and I went our separate ways and I carried on making the beer, Neil Morris's Blonde, it's called now. Nice. And set up a pub with Richard Slingsby, who's now my business partner in the pub and the beer business. So this is the Plume of Feathers, isn't it? That's your, the Plume of Feathers pub. in Barliston. Tell me what it's like. It's lovely. Great food. We've got a great chef, Bruce. Bruce Mackey is absolutely fantastic. It's, it's actually, we, we prettied it up a bit when we got it because it did look a bit like a 70s building because I think that's when it was put up. There's always been a pub on the site. And I'd love to see any photos of when it was originally built, but it's quite a big space. You know, it's got a, an open fire in one uh, part of it, so you can, you know, it looks really pretty. Uh, ten ales on the bar, fantastic food, great staff, I love them. It's right on the Trent Mersey Canal as well, so you can sit out by the canal and watch the swans and the ducks go by while you're having a pint. It's a sort of a destination pub. Barliston was where... Wedgwoods. It was like Josiah's grandson built a house there, and that's where the Wedgwood Museum is, etc. So it's a pretty lovely little village with this wonderful pub. There is another pub as well, um, but. Uh, and can you go and have a peaceful pint? In it? I'm, I'm guessing people want to come and chat to you. If, if I'm going to be up there, we announce it. Do you? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Which is why I didn't go there at all in the pandemic because number one just outdoors and things, and then getting on trains and planes and um, all that kind of stuff was just would have been ir irresponsible. And more irresponsible to attract more people to the pub. So, but generally, yeah, we're, we put a notice out so that people who have wanted to come and have a, a hello, then it can happen on that day or that evening when I'm in there. Last time I was up there was not long ago, handing out the prizes for the quiz. So that was really nice. And a few people do turn up who want photos and autographs and, and what have you. But no, it is really easy. I sat down and had my supper and that was fine. People don't come over and bother you too much, but I go round to each table. I can see the shyness in people's eyes, you know, and I go, I will go round to people's tables and say hello and shake hands and do all of that and have a chat to everyone. When we touch on men behaving badly, that is really, I would have thought, although you mentioned TVs, line, TVs mm. in line of duty, I would imagine men behaving badly is probably when you, just like kind of shot to fame, that's a bit of a naff line, but oh, you yeah. know what I mean, when you suddenly went from actor Neil Morrissey to, to household name yeah. Neil Morrissey, what was that transition like? How did you adapt to that? Oh, it was a proper rumble track. It's probably the, the ambition of all young actors to be catapulted to these levels of fame. I mean, it really was, I couldn't, I didn't go on the tube for a decade. I just couldn't get on the tube. It was uh, too wild trying to get anywhere. You know, you get surrounded, especially in the evenings, you know, on a Friday night especially or anything like that. It's sort of surrounded by blokes all wanting to talk to you, et cetera. But it was easy to get um, tables in restaurants. <laughs> I'm sure it was. But, you know, later on, just because then there's – it was like being fired out of a crossbow again. You know, it was just such a rise to – Fame, it happened so quickly. And then, of course, there's the interest that comes along with that, with the um, the media interest, et cetera. And this is during the whole period of um, hack phone hacking, et cetera, et cetera. So wherever you went, there was a photographer. Wherever you went, there was a newspaper man asking questions. They were parked outside your house um, all day, et cetera, et cetera. So that bit was a bit irksome. But you got you had to, I suppose you've got to balance it off against what it brings to you in terms of your future security, financially, et cetera, et cetera. The hacking was awful. It was terrible, and it, you know, this was, when you think that your friends might be going to the press with stories about you, or phoning the press to let them know where you are, and you start to mistrust the people who are close to you, you know, and then the, what they're writing as well, which is complete 
Macintosh. Were you a victim of that, back. Neil? Were you a victim of some hacking and stuff? Oh, my Lord. They were hacking me for more than 15 years. Really? Oh, my goodness. I, I didn't realise that. Yeah. No, it was uh, every week it was relentless. There was something else in the paper. You know, I've always been a glass half full, so um, I didn't let it upset me too much. But it was, it did make you wonder about who you're hanging out with and what, what's around you and who are, who, who are the people around you, who do you trust, which is a terrible thing, a terrible thing to... Uh, it's horrible to go through that kind yeah, of thing, isn't it? Yeah, that happen. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. How did you get into acting in the first place? I know it was when you were young. Yeah. Um, you went to drama school, didn't you? But, yeah. but, why, but why acting? I was brought up in children's homes, and when I was about when I was about ten, uh, and then I was in um, various a few various homes before I landed in one in Stoke on Trent, and was then going back to normal school. So I must have been eleven and a half, maybe twelve, when that started to happen. I was in um, an English class where we'd got a new teacher, Sheila Steele. God rest her; she's gone now. Aww. And um, Sheila, I was being a bit raucous. Uh, uh, she told me to get out and stand outside, which I did. She came out and slammed a script in my chest and said, you're in the school play. Learn Colonel Jeffries. So I did. And that was my first play. And I loved it. Loved it to death. It was, a, it was an outlet. I was suddenly getting a bit of praise um, for, uh, for stuff. And I was, it was comedy as well. And then, then did the next school play and then actively started to seek out drama in my area. Then there was Stoke... Stoke Schools Theatre did that, and I used to work down at the local repertory as well, which was an amateur slash semi-professional. It was self-supporting, doing backstage stuff, painting, did the whole relighting, the, the whole everything that you can imagine backstage. Uh, and also, we were then occasionally extras in the grown-up plays as well. And that's that. That was it, really. I mean, I decided that that's what I wanted to do. I had to tell them that I wanted to be a doctor uh, at the kids' home and the, the um, careers officer because no one wants to hear actor. And so I did biology, chemistry and physics, as well as drama, <laughs> which I dropped all of at the A-level. Because I'd got, by, by the time I'd finished my A-levels, I'd already been accepted into the Guildhall School of Music and Drama. So I went down there and, you know, it was, that's where it all started. But I always wanted to do it. You know, I couldn't believe my luck when I got in. Same day, uh, on the same back channel as A.D. Dunbar. We were in the same group and we both got in at the same time and we both spent our youth together. Wow, that's so nice to hear that you've been friends from that time and that his family gave you some kind of family love when you probably really needed it. Yeah. Did because, you really appreciate that time, oh, spending it with with them in a family environment? Yeah, because, I mean, I'd been fostered by the Langstons. Thank you, the Langstons. From about nearly 17, I think. So for about a year and a half, I was, I was fostered. So that's my first sort of reintroduction into family life, you know, after so long in the care system, as it were. Not that it was awful. I mean, Auntie Margaret, who's still a good friend of mine now, Margaret Cartledge, she um, she was really good to me, you know, and uh, really good with me as well. Because I was obviously bright. I was in top stream at school, knocking out the exams like Billy O. And she, she used to treat me really well. So, I mean, occasionally she brought me down. I probably shouldn't even say this. She brought me down. I'd go down to her house with her and Frank to watch telly later than my bedtime and have a glass of cider. Oh, oh you're so goodness. wild. I so wild. Crazy. And um, so that was uh, all good fun. I mean, I don't remember. I mean, there must have been bleak spots, I suppose. Like I say, I've always been a glass half full and a... Who knows? I've never, never had um, a therapy or anything like that. But I wonder if they'd have me all, they'd have me all crying and all of this about what I didn't get and what I didn't have. But I don't really miss any of it. I tell you, when you did make me cry, I watched your documentary that you did. I think it was about ten years ago. Yeah. Where, where I think you felt the time was right, and maybe you felt perhaps you were ready to look back at those days, and you went back to the courtroom where I yeah. think it was some petty theft, wasn't it? And you said oh, that. Yeah. You and your brother are up and I remember you saying, it makes me choke up actually, you said you looked at your mum and she was crying and you and your brother were sent out different doors. You didn't see him for 10 years. No. And, I, and I thought it was a really, really brave to explore that for the cameras. Mm. But could you take me back, what was that like now when you sat in, can you still remember sitting in that courtroom yeah. and wondering what the hell was happening to you? Yeah, it was a big moment because um, the, the solicitor, the lawyers or wherever they were, big men who spoke really properly. 
as far as I could tell. I mean, I'd only had those kind of people, were teachers or whatever, you know. And so when he said, oh, is your name Neil Anthony Morrissey of whatever, this is where you used to live or whatever. And I, just, I said, yes. And he leaned down and said, yes, sir. And so, so it started off in that sort of tone. I mean, in my mind, I'm going out of the courtroom and getting back on the bus and I've had a day off school, you know, I'll probably get a donut on the way home or something. But no, like I said, they were talking about care orders and this and that and the other. I didn't understand a word that was being said. I'm 10 years old, you know, maybe 10 and a half or something like that. And my brother's sitting next to me. Then literally, people were rising to leave. Um, So we stood up and um, someone came to collect us. And me and my brother were taken out of Wanderer. And I, as I said, I looked around behind me and my mother was crying. My dad was crying and they were taken out of another door. And then I didn't see them for about six weeks. So now me and my brother get taken to, it's his birthday as well, May the 9th. Yeah. And he gets taken to, we get taken to the social services offices. And then he goes out with one social worker and I'm there by myself now. I think there was a suite involved. Someone gave me a a toffee or something like that. And then literally within minutes, I was taken in a car to an assessment centre in Stafford. And that was that. Uh, I didn't see my brother till for for 10 years and my time in care started. Didn't see my mum and dad for about six weeks. Um, And they like you to settle in without them, get used to not being um, them, not being around, etc. And you literally just are there and you have to find your feet. Which is that—that that was a bit scary. Was it a tough environment to find your feet? I mean, you're so little. There were big boys there too. There was were kids there? there younger than me, and there was kids there up to 16, 17, You know, with tattoos and things like that. Hard lads who were like in and out of the care system, cocky, all of that kind of thing. And I was like little mouse that came in. But you have to learn quite quickly. I remember pretty much the first thing that happened was these tattoos were put on. Ten years old, and I thought they were going to wash off that night. In fact. When that one was done, I had to go to the hospital and have a tetanus because it all got infected. And I had no idea that they were going to stay on. And Em says, you know, my missus says, don't don't take them off because they're like your um, juvenile delinquency scars, you know. (laughs) They're kind of part of who you are, I guess. Have you been tempted to take them off or not? I I did have them um, looked at once by someone, by an unsympathetic doctor when I was a young actor and not making much money, if any, who drew a circle around them with a biro and said, that's how big your scars are going to be. I went, all right, I'll keep them. <laughs> and who did th- who did them, Neil? Like other, just other boy. lads, other big know. boys? Just, yeah, just the big boys. Just did them. Mm. Oh, my goodness. I, and did you get to the bottom of why? I mean, did you spend your childhood thinking you'd been a really naughty boy and yeah. not really understand why you'd been taken away from, from mum and dad? No, I didn't know why. And uh, I assumed it was because of breaking and entering uh, criminal activity, a bit of vandalism, a bit of this, you know. But when you look at what we actually took, it might be five pounds. Uh, and I remember in one, there was a packet of Horlicks sweets. Now it's on a 50 pence piece. Or oh, something I like, like that. those Horlicks sweets. Horlicks sweets, yeah, they were lovely, those, weren't they? Yeah, so I yeah. took them. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> I'm not stupid, but No. <laughs> <laughs> and then got caught for it. You know, there was all kinds of things like that. But there that. were little things, though, weren't they? That, oh, it that, wasn't that's very That's why much. it must have seemed so baffling, well, the sorts that, of things you'd have probably been put to bed early for and not yeah, at absolutely. home. Not... Or be taken back to the shop, you know. Yeah, and, and apologised. Yeah, and exactly, exactly. Apparently, which I didn't find out until, I mean, what, what age was I? Probably in my late 40s, early 50s, when I made that programme, Care Home Kid, and Mr. Pease, who was my social worker, said, but you, you probably don't remember the state of your home, the state of your house, what it looked like, and the squalor, and the, the dirt, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And of course you don't. You don't see that. You just see mum's bosom and the, what comes out of the frying pan and what time you go to bed. They'd probably go to the pub, my parents, and then we would sneak out of the house and go around and pinch bikes and do things like that, climb over the fence at school and go into the swimming pool and things like that. So we were kind of... Smart, but maybe slightly reckless. <laughs> yeah, but certainly not to be taken away. Did you, did you hope when you did that documentary to try and uncover what's happening nowadays in the care mm. system and to try and find out what is happening to, to young people? Well, the, the system is better than it was, but it doesn't cure the, the fact that it's still happening on a regular basis. Um, similar reasons, kids uh, whose parents are drug addicts or 
or, or who have problems. And sometimes the kid would come there because the parents were getting a divorce and the mother or father couldn't cope and the child would be taken into care. I mean, I don't know how much of that goes on, but now, nowadays they don't separate families or they try not to separate families where that was the policy back in those days. And th- it's like it's like any game. There's, there's lots of people out there who are amazing and doing fantastic things, and there's a hell of a lot of abuse that goes on too. I mean, even as far as um, recruiting county lines kids and all that particularly post-18. I mean, there is still nothing uh, for kids post-18 once you come out of the care system. They literally draw a line under it, and there are uh, places that you can apply for, like houses where you go out to work and they take a bit of rent, or there's some charitable ones that are set up. And uh, these are where the kids are very vulnerable because they're like young adults now. I had my mind and my vision set on being an actor, and if I didn't get in as an actor at 18, I was going to try and join the... National Youth Theatre, and whatever happened, I was going to end up in London somewhere. I was going to be in London uh, because that's where the action was, and that's where I I went anyway. But a lot of them don't get these, don't get the opportunities, and don't get. They may may have fallen behind in education, etc., as well, and gangs, the gangs around here, and that kind of thing. You know, because you're 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 searching for a family, you're searching for someone to pat you on the back or give you a bit of praise or this, that, and the other. And this is what happens with the county lines dudes. You know, they start off being your mate. Hey, here's this. Have a puff of that. Have a drink on this. Here's 100 quid. Go and get yourself a new pair of jeans, blah, blah, blah. Then before you know it, you're in the back of a van on the way to uh, Scarborough or whatever with 10 kilos of cocaine to distribute in a week with phone numbers and and gangs smacking you to buggery if you don't, don't do what you're told. It's scary stuff. I, I tell you another part that... I remember is when you did a bit with Martin Clunes and you were going through your files, big files all about you and your childhood. And then it said, Neil is 18, case closed. Mm -hmm. That just really sums up what you were saying there, doesn't it? About you then thrust into the big wide world, you're adult and there's no support and no help. And I suppose in a way, did drama save you? Yeah, I mean, if, if I hadn't gotten to drama school, Lord knows what I'd, I'd have done. I'd have tried again the following year because my um, auditions were quite good, but I couldn't afford any more. I could only afford two, one was for Central and one was for the Guildhall, and that was having worked at um, Just Pants Plus on a Saturday in Hanley. <laughs> I guess and that I has its get... bonuses, does it? <laughs> yeah. Did you get discount Just yeah, Pants yeah. Plus? Yeah, yeah, we'd get 40% yeah. off yeah, on nice. certain items. Well, actually, I came to London and only had... I think I had two pairs of jeans, a bunch of T-shirts. I didn't have an overcoat. I don't know why I didn't have an overcoat. Um, anyway, uh, and uh, someone eventually gave me an overcoat when it got further into the term because I was just freezing. Uh, and a pair of plimsolls. And I had no grant either. I had no money. All right. So um, when we were doing the registration in the September... And they said, Neil, can we have a word with you after we've done the registration? And everyone gets registered. They'll go off to another room. And they said, well, we haven't received any money for you. I said, correct. <laughs> they said, well, what are we going to do about it? I said, we're going to write to my MP and you're going to, you're going to say that the school doesn't operate without me, that I'm fantastic and they need to give you some money to pay for me. And uh, you're, you're going to back me and I'll get my social workers to write a letter as well and a teacher from my sixth form college, et cetera, and we'll, and we'll get some money. And we did. I got a 50% grant, which for me, the most importantly, paid my fees. So I was allowed to be at the school. And then I had some ridiculous sum, like for a 12-week term, I had like 200 quid or something like that. But I sofa surfed and people fed me and people bought me drinks. Like famously, Charlie Lawson, who was at our drama school as well, the year above me, he'd just inherited some money from a great-grandparent or something like that. And so he'd bring it out for for a drink. He'd say, you're coming for a drink? I'd say, I've got no money. He said, I didn't ask you if you had any money. I asked you, are you coming for a drink? <laughs> <laughs> and so you'd go out and get a, and have a drink with someone and uh, all the fun. Yeah, it was, it was great, but I never ever saw that as a problem either. I was doing what I wanted with like-minded people having the best time of my life. It was absolutely fantastic. And naturally, you proved very good at it. And here we sit, 40 <laughs> years on, with just looked at your kind of resume for when I was just researching. And mm. every year you're in more than one thing and it's just been constant. What makes your heart skip when your agent rings and says, Neil, you know, 
we want you to audition for this or this director wants you for that. What are the projects now, now that you're in a position where presumably you can cherry pick and you've been in that position for a long time, what are the projects that you really, really enjoy doing? You know, you never know until they drop on your doorstep. I mean, it can be a writer that gets you going. They will say, oh, Simon's written this new thing or Tony Jordan's doing this or, you know, and you go, oh, well, let's have a look at that. And sometimes you hear from a mate, oh, I've just been cast in this thing and it's written by him, directed by him. And I go, well, why wasn't I up for it? <laughs> What's going on there? What do you mean you're going off to Budapest for 15 weeks riding horses and killing people with a sword? <laughs> Why aren't I in any of that stuff? I've always wanted to do that. Yeah, I mean, uh, ideally, I don't know. A wizened priest in the Game of Thrones prequel or something. Someone, someone who gets his head lopped off. Those are really good jobs. You know, getting shot four times in the face. I mean, th- those are kind of dream jobs. And like I say, it could be a director or a writer or a request from someone, uh, and then you read the part and make a decision. So you don't, but you never really know until they drop through your door what's what's out there. We interviewed for the podcast, lovely Alan Scott, the screenwriter, the other week. Okay, who told the story of falling in love with the Queen's Gambit, the Walter oh. Tevis novel? In I think he read it in about 1985, and he took the rights to it. And it took him 30 years to get it on Netflix. And when it finally went to air, he was in hospital with COVID. And he thought he was hallucinating because he'd been in the edit suite so many times. And it had been, right. he, he stresses it wasn't every day he was trying to make it for 30 years, but it was a 30-year passion. He knew that story had to be told. And look at it now. It was 65 brilliant. 65 million viewers worldwide. Well, it was just truly fantastic. Another one of the great stepping stones, I think. You know, I mean, who would have thought that you could make a, pro- a, a fantastic, intriguing, sexy, scary programme about chess? And the girl in it was absolutely brilliant. I can't remember her name off the top of my head. Anya Taylor-Joy, who's also in the new season of Peaky Blinders, which oh. I also love. Oh, I could see you in Peaky Blinders, well, playing I could see a baddie. You in Peaky Blinders, especially as I'm one of the only Midlanders out there on the... Well, exactly. You know, that would be authentic, wouldn't That's it? That's me and Kevin McNally and Mark Williams have always had a bone to pick with them people. <laughs> we need you in Peaky Blinders, I no, think. No, I think this is the end, last one, isn't it? Yeah, it it's, well, so it's not time for you, because there's only one episode no, gone. It'll be all shot now. It's all, it's all in the can oh it was sad actually can, did you see the did you see the first of yeah, the new did. episodes with the tribute to helen mccrory yeah, know, oh my brilliant. god that must have been so difficult for the well, actors to, to give, do that they gave exquisite articles about about that all of them did didn't they um that was just an awful awful shame i mean so young as well and so brilliant yeah so talented um i think i interviewed her for hugo martin scorsese's right. fabulous film and she was absolutely divine mm. and you're very proud of staffordshire as well aren't you oh yeah love it i read i saw your love letter to stafford staffordshire right yes i didn't realize that the spitfire was designed yeah mitchell the no, Mitchell Memorial Theatre there. in Hunley was thingy mitchell can't remember his first name offhand but he yeah he designed the spitfire Amazing. Robbie Williams. Obviously. I mean, what would the world be without a Robbie Williams in it? <laughs> Stoke City Football Club. Well, I'm not a fan of Stoke City, but I mean, it's, it's, that's a good reason for, uh, for having that there. Freddie Jones as well. Freddie Jones, famous, very good actor, Freddie Jones. I saw him many times doing many things. And then later in life had several drinks with him. Did you? Well, several. Was a proper mm. toper. Yeah, several, yeah. <laughs> So what are you up to now? What are we going to see you talking about next? Well, hopefully we'll be more good karma, which we start shooting later in the in the year. But I'm doing this thing. I'm doing a couple of little wee bits and pieces. So I'm doing this thing um, with Sarah Cox, who does a thing called Between the Covers, where you have to read. Um, you, they send you a couple of books which you read, and then you go and talk about them. And then you talk about a book that you loved as well from your, your past or, or, or history. So I've been doing my homework, and I've just finished reading that that Monica Alley Love Marriage as well, which is really good. And I've chosen Disgrace by J.M. Kutzi uh, and uh, potentially um, Long, Long Way, which is a Sebastian Barry. And why did you choose those in particular? D- well, Disgrace, if you've never read it. I've never, never read, read it, any no. Coatsy, oh, no, I haven't. I've led a, led a very sheltered life. It'll blow your mind. Will it? It's brilliant. I mean, how he gets so much exposition into so little writing is just beyond. Um, plus the tension, etc., and the story and the development of the characters. It's just, it's a wonderful thing. That sounds a fun project to do. Sarah Cox is great, isn't she? Yeah, I love her. I like her. I love Absolutely. her on the, uh, I love her on Radio 2 as yeah, well. She's too. fabulous on yeah. there. She's. I've been on lots of long journeys recently where she's 
kept me company. Yeah. She's got a great personality. And what's your other project you're doing? I'm doing another little thing, uh, Richard Osman's House of Games. Can't oh. wait to do that. Favourite quiz show on telly. And um, that's up in Glasgow, so we'll be going up there to do that. Wow. And how do you chill? I mean, it sounds to me like you're always busy. You're always on our telly. Yeah. What, what do you? What's your idea of relaxing other than a pint in your pub? Well, that's, that's it. <laughs> it's a pint in the pub. I mean, obviously, when we're in France, I sit around in the garden, swim, go for walks, all the usual sort of stuff, really, the stress busters. But down here, I love going to the pub. All my mates are there. The, the, the local guys are really fantastic. And I'm the only lardy da. Um, that's one of the staff is a lardy da as well. But, you know, you've got, uh, you know, ex telecoms worker, uh, um, and my mate, Sean, is a barrister. And then there's um, Tom Construction. Tom's is in big construction stuff. Uh, and um, Richard Matz, who's um, healthcare, uh, a mental healthcare worker, is working with the Afghan refugees at the moment. And, and then many others that pop in there. Hugo Spear lives up the road and he always comes down and have a pint. He's away this weekend. It's all about good conversation, isn't it? We put the world to rights, you yes, know, and yeah, everyone's sure equal. Do. The, it's a, the, the pub is a great leveller. You know, you're all there. We all um, buy our drinks and uh, and it's just really good fun. You're picking up local information the whole time. It's better than the local newspaper. You know what? Everywhere's going on. I mean, I've got my present guy that's going to come and fix my roof. Um, he's... Uh, a guy um, who someone from the pub knows who did a good job. You know what I mean? It's that kind of thing. It's um, the centre of my world. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of the centre of my world. I spent a long time trying to save great British pubs yes, with, uh, with actor Neil Stook. Stooky. Yeah, he got me re- got me wrapped up in that for a couple of years, which was, was a fantastic thing to do. But the thing that drove me was, apart from the fact lots of my family own pubs so I sort of grew up around great pubs in Lincolnshire wow but it is the heart of the community and it's where anybody can go and you can go yeah. on your own and you can sit and read the paper or do the crossword or That's have a great right. conversation and it's so important that we preserve those those places so yeah that- but this this one was saved by a community project it was um, um Richard Matz one of the guys I told you about who got the petition together and said no this is a, of um, a com- it's a community asset and it should be kept as so. And if you get enough signatures, then it'll be become a pub. And I used to, when I first moved in to this particular uh, apartment, I didn't go to that pub. I used to have to walk away to another pub and I didn't like, there was, there was several pubs in, in the area that were okay. But the pub that I really loved was up in Highgate. And I used to go up there, the Duke's Head, uh, because the ales you got in there and the staff and everything, it was cool, man. And then they took the pub down the road. They yes. took the, literally the pub, which is from my front door, is 300 steps. Uh, um, so I couldn't believe it. I was, I was so overjoyed. Uh, and uh, it used to only be about six of us drinking there. Now it's so popular. We often sit there on a Thursday evening and go, where are all these people from? <laughs> literally the six of us. Do you miss it? Because you said when, when I first arrived, you were talking about France and going there. And I know you're in the middle of nowhere in France, which mm. has a beauty to itself to yeah. be in the wilds and not see anybody or traffic or whatever. But do you miss it when you, you, you go out to France? Massively. I, I, I really miss going to the pub. It always gets me. And, but I'm, I'm, I'm in communication with some of the boys, you know, I send them a photo of me and they send me a photo of the pub, you know. So, yeah, I do. I do miss it when I'm not there. And is, do you find it's good for you, though, in France just to unwind and be in the middle of nowhere and just you know, have time to read and mm. reflect and, and, and have a rest, really? Yeah, cogitate. It takes a while just to get used to the silences and the, um, and the quietness, you know. It takes a while to settle into that not being able to hear anything and um if if you if a car goes by you're kind of curious about it it takes a while to just get rid of the noises of the city and um the activity and the phone and this and that and the other not that we're in communicado down there because of course we have wi-fi and um phones but it's the signals are more difficult to get hold you have to of. stand on one leg and put your yeah. right arm in the air maybe sometimes you have to walk up the driveway you yeah know, and uh, go and take your phone to try and get a call or receive a call but you're right i do love it out there to just um Calm down. Yeah. I mean, one time we've been out there, we were out there for a couple of months and we had to, I had to we, had, we got back. So we got, we flew straight back in and then I had to be in Oxford Street or somewhere up Oxford Street for a, a meeting. And so we're walking up Oxford Street with um, a rollerboard, you know, thinking, oh my God, it's people, there are so many people. And you have to people dodge. You feel like a, a trout going the wrong way in the, <laughs> to spawn it was um you know it was a bit scary when you when you come back so we try we get now we if we drive we'll drive back here and uh 
take it easy for a day before going out into the town. Oh, it's been a pleasure chatting to you today. I'm hoping you might have a big birthday looming. I have in so, July. Yes. How do you feel about your big birthday looming? I, I, I don't feel any different to when I was having my 40th birthday. Don't you? That's I'm a little good. bit more achy. Yeah, are you? You know, and there's a few more lines appeared and all of that. A bit of sciatica occasionally. But apart from that, no, I don't feel that much different, to be to be honest. So when is your birthday? I thought I'd get more mature. Oh, no, I don't you think don't, you've got more really? mature, have yeah, you? No. <laughs> I interviewed you a long time ago for Men Behaving Badly, and I'm pleased to report you haven't got any more mature at all. <laughs> you're, you're a little bit of a silver fox now, which suits you very much. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I, like I think that. that's good. A good head of hair. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll buy you a pint for your big birthday, oh, if you'd like. I'd love one. Would you? Yeah. Good. Let's do that. Good. Thank you so much, Nia. It's, it's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, it's been great to spend um, time today, have a couple with you, romp through your career and and life. And uh, yeah, I shall look forward to that part. Yeah, it's lovely to see you again. Take care. You've been listening to actor Neil Morrissey talking about everything from drama and acting to beer and pubs and giving us an insight into well, his life, really, his life, his childhood and hopes for the future. Uh, download and subscribe to our series at convex.podbean.com or search The Convex Conversation on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple and Google Podcasts, wherever you listen to yours. I'll be back next week cogitating with uh, another great guest. I'll see you then. 